Hi, welcome to Midwest Magic Cleaning. My name is I Forgot to Take Before Pictures. Now, coincidentally, I did in fact forget to take before pictures, but that has nothing to do with my name. So when we get to the end of this video, you're gonna have to remember what you're seeing here and then compare it to the after shots that I show you and then just kind of mentally be like, wow, that guy is awesome. Now, before I get too much of this cleaned, keep in mind I'm six foot four, so you can compare my height to the height of that stuff behind me and it'll give you an idea of what we're dealing with here. This is my garage, and after it hit a certain state of messiness, I told my wife to just go crazy in here, throw everything that could go in a dumpster straight out into the garage. We would let it collect for a while, and then I would film the cleanup, and it would also give me an opportunity to talk about a couple of subjects that I think are important. So we let this go for about half a year, and as you can see, we have tons and tons of boxes, but even under those boxes are a lot of things that we haven't used in many years. They've just existed out here. And I think that even people who don't have hoarding disorder can fall victim to kind of what we fell victim to here, which is what I'll call I'll deal with it later syndrome. This is like, let's say you order a package from Amazon. It arrives, you unpackage it, you get the shiny new toy out of it. Then you just throw the box in the garage. And you're like, I'll just break it down and deal with it later. If you have recycling in your area, you're like, I'll put it in the recycling bin later. We don't in our area, but I mean the trash can is like 15 steps away from where we'd throw it anyway. We're just like, we'll break it down and put it in the trash later. Then over the course of weeks, those start to build up, and the more that pile builds up, the more work it's going to take to break them all down. So I'll deal with it later becomes easier and easier to do. So it starts out super nonchalant, just throw the box in there and you're like, I'll deal with that single box later. But the bigger it gets, every time you go out there, you're like, okay, okay, that's going to take me 10 minutes to break all the boxes that have accumulated down so they can be thrown away. Then the next time, like a week later, you'll see it and think, okay, that's going to take 30 minutes to do. So I don't really have time to deal with that right now. Then it gets bigger and bigger to the point to where you finally hit a breaking point and you're like, okay, this is going to take two hours. Now it's something I have to schedule. Let's get this out of here before it gets any more out of control. And this can happen to people who don't have ADHD who don't have hoarding disorder, who aren't lazy. It's just a room that no one sees. Like company doesn't access your garage, so you throw it all in the garage. Or nobody ever goes into the spare bedroom or the art room. So you throw all your crap in there and just close the door and it builds up over time. I'll deal with it later syndrome is the biggest cause of messes outside of hoarding disorder and severe ADHD that I've ever dealt with. This is where it becomes the easiest for a real really immature person to look at somebody who's built up this pile and just call them lazy. But in my experience, that's rarely the case. It's a case of a person doing their normal everyday things. They open their Amazon package, they get their stuff out, they throw the box in there. They're like, I'll deal with it later because right now I'm doing dishes. I have to figure out dinner. I've got a load of laundry going. I haven't sat down in two hours. I still have spin kick classes to go to and my dogs aren't going to practice wrestling moves on each other. That's what I'm for. The box is insignificant. Everything else takes precedence. So it's only when that pile gets gigantic that it actually takes on some importance and becomes a priority. And if those things are being put in a room that nobody accesses or rarely goes into, then it's going to take a long time before that pile is recognized. It's kind of an out of sight, out of mind thing. Once you shut that door, your brain goes on to other more important subjects than that box or that small pile of boxes or that eight foot pile of boxes. Now, in this case, underneath those boxes is a whole bunch of extra stuff that we used to actually use. But once it lost its purpose or its value, it just got shoved in the garage too. So there's a clothes rack that we actually used at one point, but it's just been out in the garage for the last like four years. This is where I had to step in and tell my ADHD wife, there are certain things that you're going to see that have potential, but really realistically, they're never going to realize that potential. We just have the stuff because we have it. So whenever I'm cleaning out a garage, especially a really cluttered garage, I have to think in terms of purpose. Does this thing serve a purpose? Is it actually going to be used for that purpose? Regardless of whether the item's good or not, are we keeping it just because it's good? If that's the case, then those things have to go. It doesn't matter if they're donated or thrown in a dumpster or sold in a garage sale. We've 
reached a point in my own household where we have to make a decision. Do we value the space or the stuff more? And that's going to vary from room to room. And that leads me to my first subject that I really wanted to talk about, which is people seeing potential in an object and keeping it because of that potential. You see this a lot in hoarding disorder. People will be like, well, I can't throw that box away. I could use that to wrap Christmas presents in. I can't throw these old clothes away because I can use them to make quilts or whatever. No, don't throw away that 1990s TV because if my current TV goes out and I don't have the money to buy a new one, I could always use the 1990s TV as a backup. And realistically, none of those things are going to happen. They're never making a quilt out of the old clothes. The old boxes are just going to sit in the garage and gather mold and dust and spiders. In the case of the clothes rack that I mentioned earlier, that just became a shelf for other things that we didn't use to go on to. And so we had to be realistic about the genuine potential of an item. If the item never sees the potential that you see in your head, it's a worthless item. I mean, potentially the boxes that I'm breaking down here could be compressed back down into their original carbon form with so much pressure that they turn into literal diamonds. That's the potential that those boxes have, but that's never going to happen unless I get like really mad and just decide to wad one up and squeeze it with my Hulk-like strength. But it takes a lot to make me that mad, so that's probably not going to happen. It's unrealistic potential that's causing clutter to invade my home. And sometimes I even go through it where I'm thinking, I can't throw those things away because fill in the blank. It can be used for whatever. And I have to stop and tell myself, no, this is my house and I'm not allowing the clutter to push me out of my own home. The stuff that I own exists to serve me and not the other way around. And if that stuff isn't serving me, then it's, it's got to go. It's getting evicted from my home. If you ever find yourself in that situation where you can't quite make yourself get rid of the stuff because of the potential, that's when it's a really good idea to have a friend or a relative or a spouse there to help you make those decisions. Because if you're on the fence with an item, there's a very good chance that you're on the fence for a reason and it should be tossed. If you have somebody there helping you organize and go through your stuff, they can be a deciding factor or a heavy influence on which side of the fence that object falls. Because like it or not, sometimes it takes an extra person to help strong arm you a little bit in the right direction to say, no, 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 no. You're keeping this thing just to keep it. It's time to let that go. You haven't seen it in three years. It's been under a giant pile of rubbish. If it's really that important to you, it never would have ended up at the bottom of a pile of garbage. Though to be fair, that is where I found my oldest son, Jason, and we decided to keep him, which turned out to be a benefit for everyone.
The other thing I wanted to talk about is a question that I get on almost every video, which is how do you even know where to start? The short answer is three feet at a time. The longer answer is 10 feet at a time. hi -oh! Okay, idiocy aside, I look at a garage as sort of like a grid. I'm gonna break this down into smaller sections. So I'm gonna look at this area that's along the wall. And the only thing that I'm concerned about is getting everything away from this wall. All trash goes in the dumpster. All useful items get pulled away from the wall and I'll deal with those whenever I get to them. My number one goal is to get everything away from this area. In the process of doing that, you're gonna run into some things that you know where they go. You're like, oh, okay, here's this live mongoose that I've had out here forever. I know it goes in the mongoose cage, so you just go put it there. Other things that you find, you may have a decent idea where they go, but you, you haven't quite decided on that. Just put those all in a pile. In my case, I'm putting all that right in the dead center of the garage, and then I'm going to start sorting that stuff later. But my goal is just this wall. Now, as I'm putting things in the middle of the garage, I may have larger sections that I want to put them into. So in other words, all cleaning supplies that I find may go in a giant pile. Then all tools that are going to go in the tool shed can all go in their own section. I'm going to save a handful of boxes because as you're cleaning a garage, you're going to find that you wished you hadn't broken them all down so that you can put some of the random stuff that you're cleaning up and sorting into those boxes. So I'll set all those aside. Any boxes that don't get used can always go in the dumpster later. There's one corner of our garage that is all my mother-in-law stuff. It's just waiting to be transported to her house in another state. So that's pretty easy to organize. I just stack that symmetrically and it just all stays by itself. But I'm not going going into detailed sorting. Otherwise, I'd get trapped in that and I'd never finish the garage. It's kind of like a jigsaw puzzle where you separate all the edge pieces into their own pile. Then you separate all the blue pieces into theirs and all the purple pieces into theirs. Then once they're in those piles, you can get a little bit more detailed in how you organize them and say, okay, these are blue pieces, but they've all got flowers on them. So I want to take all the blue flower pieces and put over here and all the blue sky pieces pieces over here because they're clearly different things. So you'll just kind of get more and more detailed as you sort. But we definitely don't do all that at once. That would be way too overwhelming.
Once I have that wall done, I'm going to kind of scan the room and see what annoys me the most. So I might say, man, this whole thing's covered in leaves. So we'll sweep out some leaves just to make it look like progression and give me some hope for completing the rest. Then I may look around after that and say, everything by my toolbox is currently annoying me. Let's clean up that section next. But I make sure that I'm just cleaning that section. Otherwise, another good way to do it is to keep with the grid system and say, all right, I've clean that wall so let's go to the next section of the grid and clean that and just work your way around the garage until it's all done whatever method keeps you going and doesn't wear you out mentally that's the correct method to use i know that people with adhd complain a lot that they tend to bounce everywhere and then they get lost in the bouncing i know other people with adhd who thrive by bouncing if you can keep motivated and not burn out and you're getting things accomplished by all means bounce around. I work the way I work because my brain operates differently than yours. It's why there can be a hundred thousand cleaning channels on YouTube all with different methods of cleaning and only like five or six would even apply to you. They may all work but they all don't work for every person out there. For a lot of people it's about tricking their own brain into completing a task and a lot of the times you can do that by picking a section that's going to be easier to do than the rest and completing that quickly so you can see the immediate results of your work. That dopamine hit that you get whenever you look at that area and see it all cleaned and tidy, even though it didn't take as much work as the rest of the garage, it gives yourself a small finish line to cross. And once you're high on that dopamine hit, you can move on to the next thing and then it gets easier and easier the further you go into your cleanup. I think about it like the way I trick moose into letting me pet their moose for I'll be like, you got a little something on your moose fur, moose. Let's me get that off of you. Thank you, human. I really, but hey, you're petting my moose fur. You done been trick talking, moose. Suck it. I mean, metaphorically speaking. So using that same method as I'm cleaning, instead of following the grid that I'd laid out mentally, I looked over in the corner and saw all my mother-in-law's stuff. And I knew that if we knocked that out really quick, that would be a small finish line for us to cross and it wouldn't take much effort. All we had to do was pull stuff out, make sure that everything in that corner was hers and not mixed in with our stuff, and then just put it back, kind of like a game of reverse Jenga. We're metaphorically petting her moose fur. But as we're getting tired as the day goes on, that little accomplishment there gives us another mental boost that we need to push on. We can finish it up, look back, and say, that's done. We don't have to do anything else with this corner. 20% of the garage is now clean and we did that in a matter of minutes. Now, let me address this because this gets asked dozens of times on every video that I do, and I've made full videos on just this subject. Why didn't you donate all that stuff? It's for multiple reasons. One, we don't really have a place to donate stuff like this. We have a couple of centers that take donations for like thrift shops or whatever, but they're specific in what they take in. So they get overloaded on certain items and not enough of others. The items that I have in here are the overload kind. But we live in a small town. The number of places that even take donations are just almost non-existent. Two, even if I did have those places to donate, you're talking about doubling or tripling the amount of time because now we have to sort all the donations into one pile. Most of the time, they're not going to come and get it. We have to take it there, which is going to take multiple trips. We have to have things sorted and cleaned. So you take a one-day garage clean out which I barely had time to do to begin with, and you're turning it into a three or four day project, a lot of times even longer than that. Number three is a lot of places that take donations will not take crappy donations. All the books that we had were foxed. They had spiders on them. A lot of them have moisture damage just from the humidity in the garage. Some of this stuff has water damage to the point that it has mold on it. Some of this stuff has mouse poop because we live close to fields. And no matter how clean you keep your home, in a rural town that is a farming community, you are going to get mice. But why don't you put it up on Craigslist? Somebody can just come and get the stuff for free. About four people in my 2,000 person town would even go on Craigslist at all. I live in a rural community that is filled with old people who don't even own computers. Most of them don't know how to operate their smartphone. And even then we run into the same thing where now my responsibility is answering questions, setting up meet times, monitoring 
ordering the ad for idiots. The Craigslist method and the Facebook method does not work in my area. We're a tiny little nothing town. But why don't you have a garage sale? Same exact issue. We have to set up all the stuff. We have to price everything. We have to advertise for it. And usually people take a week's like advance notice to even go to a garage sale in my area. So by doing that, you're asking me to add a week's worth of work on top of what I'm already doing. But just set it on the curb. Somebody will take it. There is no curb. This is a country town. And where I live, people won't just come up and take stuff on the side of the road. And yes, even if I put a sign that says free on it, I'm putting all this in a dumpster because it's the most efficient way to get this stuff out of my life. It's an issue of time. And with me working 100 hour work weeks between this channel and the billion things I do in a week, time is my most precious commodity. I'll give a little bit of insight to about the 5% of my viewers who do this particular thing. If you're watching a YouTube channel that specializes in something, say cleaning or painting, aquariums, working on car engines, whatever it is, if you comment with something that starts out with, why don't you just fill in the blank? Whatever you put in that blank is absolutely something that they've already thought of. They're not doing that thing for a reason. If they specialize in those things and they're on YouTube, especially if they have a big following, they literally make their living doing that thing. So for instance, one that I get a lot is why don't you just donate that stuff to the homeless? And mentally, I'm like, what homeless are you talking about? There are no homeless people here. We live in a small, tight knit community surrounded by cornfields and cows. And since we don't have homeless people, we don't have homeless shelters. Trust me, I'm paying $800 for this dumpster. If there was a way to get rid of all this stuff where I didn't have to pay the $800 or I was paid $800 in exchange for the stuff, I would absolutely do that in a heartbeat. But since I can't do that, it's going in the dumpster and someone else is taking it away. Anyway, if you look in the description of my videos or on the about section of the YouTube page, you're going to see links to some of the more important places where you can follow us. The most important of those being Facebook, because there are several accounts that have stolen our content and are pretending to be us. The link to the correct Facebook page is in the description of this video. You can just click that link and be taken directly to the correct page. The other is our members only section. The bottom tier gets access to Discord. The middle tier gets Discord and an extra video every week. And the top tier is just for the most insane of the insane. I make an attempt to live stream directly to them as we're doing a big cleaning so that they can see those things happen in real time. But as always, if you can't afford any of that, please, for the love of God, don't become a member. It's really not that important. It's just a way to show some extra financial support for the channel in a more direct way. Other than that, the best thing that you can do to support the channel is hit the subscribe button. We're trying to get to a million, which will give us our gold YouTube plaque, and that's the biggest thing I want out of the channel. And in fact, we're creeping up on half a million subscribers right now. But yeah, at a million subscribers, that's when I get my ultimate reward for the stuff that we've been doing. Also, it's been a while since I've mentioned it, but we do have merch. We've got t-shirts and coffee mugs and all kinds of stuff. And we're going to go ahead and add some more designs to that probably this week. The link to that is also in the description and in the bio of the YouTube page. So if you've ever seen me wearing the filth shirt with Jason's face on it or the shirt that says, oh, hey, look, more dishes or the one of me spin kicking a stove, that's all in our merch shop. From what I understand, the women's sizes run a tad small. So I would just err on the side of caution and order one size bigger than you normally get. That's just what I've been told. I don't know that for sure. I have owned this house since 2017 and I have never cleaned out this tool shed. I've also been annoyed with the doors forever and ever. And so I finally decided to just take them off. But as I'm pulling stuff out of this, it's going to look like a clown car. Things just keep coming out of there and coming out of there. But it finally felt so good to get all that stuff out because this was all things that we put in there probably the year we moved in and then just kept them because they were out of sight, out of mind. But that's where we found a whole lot of that unrealized potential. For instance, there was a giant stack of old picture frames. And when we first got them, we were like, well, we'll definitely use these at some point. But in seven years, we've never touched those things. And at some point we realized, wait a minute, if we need to put a picture in a frame, we'll just buy a new 
frame. And if it's a fancy picture, we'll just pay to get it framed by someone else who's not us. So it felt pretty good to grab that whole stack and just chuck that right in the dumpster. And again, that's one of those items that I know people would want and would probably pick up, but they're water damaged. They've got mold on them. They're covered in bug poop. Just put them in the dumpster, man. It's okay. The faster those get out of our possession, the less time we have to sit and think about whether we'd like to change our mind. And for me, putting those back into our possession would do more harm than throwing them in a dumpster. Once I got that done and organized, then I did the same thing with my toolbox. I've been fixing so many houses that aren't mine that I had a whole bunch of them just kind of piled up in my car. So I finally put all my tools back and got them cleaned up. And for a guy, the look of a brand new organized toolbox is one of the greatest things in the world. I then moved that giant entertainment center looking cabinet thing over to the opposite wall so that I could utilize that for storage. Emily has a whole bunch of stuff over there that is merchandise for music festivals that she helps operate. So she gave me permission to throw away all the old water damaged and moldy books and board games and then use that cabinet just for her merch stuff. And that really helped a lot. The aquarium was given to one of my daughter's friends. So you'll see it in the shot initially Initially, but that's gone since then. Then after all that, the only thing I really had left to do was organize my cleaning supplies, which you'll be happy to know we're about to use a whole bunch of those on an upcoming video. And then you just use a leaf blower on the garage floor to get all the uh, floor crap out of there.
And finally, I can actually use my garage for what it was meant to be used for, spin kicking. Just standing in an open garage and angrily spin kicking the open air and be like, suck it air. <laughs> Thank you guys for watching. Members, I will see you on Wednesday. Everybody else, I'll see you next weekend. Later.